Uh, today, uh, we kind of have a special treat, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to this opportunity. Um, my friend Pam Micus is going to share God's word today, and uh, so I'm excited about that. Listen, I've known Pam for over 25 years. <laughs> it's kind of crazy to be able to say that, but I have. And, uh, and honestly, um, there's n very few people like her that has been in my life where it's just a joy to s talk about Jesus. Like, we, that's all we do. We talk about Jesus, and, and she just exudes God's love. And, uh, and I know you're, you're going to be blessed to hear from her today. So uh, I'm just going to have Pam come up and share her heart today. Yeah. I came today because the Lord prompted me to. Normally, I, I like to talk face-to-face, one-on-one, so that I can feel your heart, so the Lord can share, me, share with me who you are and what needs you might have, because that's what the body does. It ministers to one another. That doesn't stop. That's 24-7. And so to stand up before you, but, you know, the Lord said, but these are your friends. This is your body. So why should you have any apprehension at all? So I don't. Or at least I won't confess that. So let the redeem of the Lord say so. Yeah. Amen. So, Psalm 107.2. I'm going to read part of this because I finished this at 4.30 this morning, although I started three weeks ago. But... I've had three deaths in the family. Um, just, I don't have to go in. Everybody could fill in blanks. Every day, I woke up. And you don't ask yourself, how are you doing? You put one foot in front of the other and say, Lord, what have you called me to do today? Because he gives you strength for the length of your day. And he will give you the grace that you need to function and to do what you need to do. But if you take back and you give heed to the flesh, the flesh rises up and it talks loud and it says, you're wrong. Yeah. But my God is mighty. He is mighty to save. So I've come to say, so, and declare the glory of God and his goodness toward us. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a teacher or a pastor. I'm not a prophet. Just someone who has experienced the transforming power of his love. Psalm 22, 22 says, I will praise you to all my brothers. I will stand up before the congregation and testify of the wonderful things you have done. So that's a testimony. And the following is my testimony. The one the Lord gave me and the path that he carved out of my stony heart at my hour of need. He redeems us from the curse of the law of sin and death and plants our feet on solid ground, giving us hind feet so that we can stand on those steep and narrow places, those rocky places in our life. And when the rivers rise high, he promises us that we'll not be consumed. Even when it seems beyond our ability to breathe in the heat of that imminent peril. He promises to walk with us through the trials and never leave us or forsake us. Deuteronomy 31 6. So I want to share uh, because this song is so powerful and what it did to transform my life I'm going to have Pastor put on a, a song. I don't wouldn't normally play a song but that song encapsulated where I was five years ago on June 10th, 2016. My world came crashing down with the death of my best friend, my soulmate, my love, my only love, my husband of 43 years and the father of our nine children. I had no identity. At least I didn't think I had one. How do I function? A few months after he passed on the way home from church, 
um, I was reflecting on something that Pastor Kevin had spoke on that day, and I don't remember the full context. Um, I didn't have time to go back and research, but it, he was addressing the body of Christ in our relationship, I think, to each other. And one of the relationships was that of a widow. And it hit me like a cannonball in my gut. Because I hadn't embraced that new function for me. I kept putting it off and saying, I didn't want to embrace that word. But as I came near to the stoplight near my home, this song played and I had never heard it before. I had to pull over because I was just gushing all over the place because it fully spoke where I was at. But I knew in order to take the next step, I had to let go of the previous. Especially the words that said, you don't live there anymore. Say goodbye to where you've been and tell your heart to beat again. So I went on and I googled this song and I had to know a little bit more about it. And uh, I found out that this song was written because a pastor in Ohio wanted to know more about the human heart in a, relating to his congregation. So there was a cardiac surgeon, so he asked if he could sit in on an open heart surgery and observe it to see what happened. Well, that particular day, the doctor um, opened the chest of this woman and repaired the repairs, made the repairs, closed her up, but they couldn't revitalize her. And that doctor did an unusual thing. He had, he and his staff knelt down before her bed and said, Mrs. So-and-so, I've repaired your heart. I made it like new again. Now you have to tell your heart to beat again. And that's the same, um, the same thought that we have to grasp hold of. It is us who makes our heart beat again for the Lord. She had to choose to walk in newness of life as we do, Romans 6, 4. Sometimes we're put in a place like Abraham and we're told to go where we don't know to possess the land. Circumstances change, even ones we don't want, but we must pick up the pieces and move forward. You don't live there anymore. You must choose by your will to embrace the new. We must get a new vision and walk out of our comfort zone. We get to choose this day whom he, we will serve. And for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. Until I realized that until I embraced that new position, I could not find my way out of the old and onto the new path that the Lord had for me. It's like old wineskins. He won't pour new wine into an old wineskin because it will just burst. But he will pour new wine into a new wineskin. When you put the new wine into the new wineskin, both are preserved. Matthew 9, 16, and 17. So I had to embrace the path that the Lord set before me, release the past, and move forward. My husband had taken on a new transformation, slipping from this life to the next, so I too had to make that transformation. My journey into the desert of my soul began as quickly as the death of my beloved. But for the grace of God, Let me tell you from experience, because sometimes we're taught, I remember years ago when I was a new believer, what's grace? And the pastor said, unmerited favor. Well, that didn't mean a hill beans to me. So what does that mean? But through my journey in life, I found out that grace is so much more. It is the life, the very life, and the very strength of God at work in your life. His grace is sufficient for you in times of weakness. Even Wikipedia has something good to say about grace. 
It's been defined, this is in quote, it's been defined as the divine influence, influence which operates in humans to regenerate and sanctify, to inspire virtuous impulses, to impart strength, to endure trial and resist temptation, and as, as an individual virtue or excellence of a divine origin. So it comes only from the hand of God. I have found it to be the power that makes your faith active. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. My husband had been ill for quite some time. He had congestive heart failure, uh, which was intensified by a childhood heart condition that he didn't know of and I didn't know of. He was un experienced uncontrolled diabetes, among other illnesses, and each day was a struggle for him. But I knew he kept pressing forward because he didn't want to let me down. He knew the hope and the promise that was in Christ. He wasn't afraid of death. But he wanted to be there for me and for his family. But he told me that he had lost his sense of purpose. So I knew that unless he received a miraculous healing, that the heart attack that he experienced, the massive heart attack, was impending. I just didn't see it coming so soon. That morning, on the June 10th, he called me over and said, Hey, hon, why don't you call your sister? and see if you can go visit her. He said, I feel really good today. And I had had to cancel many times of going to, to visit my sister because of it. And my mother-in-law, who lived downstairs on the first floor, and she had conditions too, so many times I couldn't go anywhere because I had to be there for them. So, um, but as quickly as I got to walk down the stairs, ask my mother-in-law how she was doing, came back upstairs, I don't think it was more than five minutes. And I looked at him and he's sitting on his favorite armchair, big barrel armchair, and he was slumped over and I thought, well, he must have just fallen asleep. So I, I went to him and I looked, but his eyes were open and so I immediately knew something was wrong. Now we're, Grant, it was three to five minutes. And when I came in, I just immediately, my heart wanted to go in a no-fly zone. But the presence of God came and filled my heart with a peace that passes understanding and a joy unspeakable and full of glory. So his presence was there. Beyond, I couldn't go with my brain. My brain wasn't even functioning. But being trained in CPR, I did the first thing I knew to do. And if you knew my husband, he was kind of a big guy. And to get him off the chair, dead weight, off the chair, gracefully onto the ground, I couldn't do it. I got him down, but I'm laughing. But my husband would have gotten the joke. He was in all kinds of contorted positions and I'm trying to get him down there and I'm laughing while I'm trying to you know revive him but as I begin to CPR and if you do CPR you know you don't stop until help comes so I gave him a hug and I kissed him and I begged him please don't leave me I don't want to go through this by myself please don't leave me. you pro and I should, you promised me 50 years well it was only 43 but in that mess, who can stand in the presence of their spouse that they love, that they cherish, and joke? But honestly, the joy of the Lord filled my heart because I knew where he was going and I knew who he'd be with. It was my own heart, my own pain that I had to deal with, that I never wanted to say that word, widow. Air was still... Uh, exhaling from his lungs but he wasn't inhaling anything that's how quick this was in a way I, I, I can't give you any scriptural reference or anything. 
I knew he was still there. And I knew he was rejoicing with me. And laughing at <laughs> my efforts to save him. But immediately when I started the CPR and I knew that this was not going to revive my husband. But I kept going. But as I did, the Lord spoke to me in the midst of that. And he said, I take care of the widows and orphans and I'm going to take care of you. That is a promise that I have held on, I have held before him these past five years. Because at that moment, immediately I realized, now all of this, you know how they say, you know, you're, it, it's kind of like a Rolodex in your mind as you're going through things in the presence of death. And I'm thinking, how am I going to bury you? How am I, we have $50 in our bank account. There's uh, all the money that he had had for retirement we had to spend because of his illness. He, Social Security was not, you know, a, a benefit for me. So, Lord, you're going to have to take care of me. But God had already given me that promise. So I said, okay, we're going to do this together, Lord. And at that moment, he took my hand and he said, I will become the husband to the widow. And he became my husband. And I will tell you, he has supplied and resupplied and given over and abundantly more than I could have ever thought or even known to ask. A few days after, um, after his funeral, um, a friend that I had known that had come, and his, it, was ta it took place right here among his friends. And a um, few days after that, a friend of mine came and said, you know, Pam, I, I have an idea of what you can do to work from home to, to, and still be there for your family. And I said, okay, so I had a job. Friends and family and this church, this body gathered together and took care of me and my family. I can't say I wasn't wandering aimlessly because I was at times. Because everything I did reflected my husband before, or my children. And now there was no response back. So it was like an echo, and I had to learn to walk in that depth with the Lord um, alone. Um, so the only thing I could do was go and hang on to the hem of my Savior's garment. And I had to confess that promise when it looked like every path that we came across, that it looked like there was no way to pass through it. I had to cling on to that promise. You said you would take care of me. Could I go by my feelings? No. Could I go by what things looked like? No. You, as a believer, you don't ask yourself that. You ask yourself, Lord, what do you have me to do? Because when Mary told the disciples, when Jesus, they were at the wedding, and they needed, they were out of wine. And she, what did she say to the disciples? Do whatever he tells you to do. Why? Because in that number one, she knew her authority as his mother. He knew his authority as God. So you have to know your authority and your place. Then you have ability to speak to God as your friend, as your father. Whatever you have need of at that moment, and you can only do that by the Spirit of Grace. And then my heart, my, my health started failing me. One day I had to have three of my kids take me to the hospital because I couldn't breathe anymore. <sighs> I was breathing like this. And I, my heart wasn't working right. I was pale and weak. I had been for a long time, but I just kept ignoring it because I had a household to take care of. I had family things to do. Um, I had just so, you know, you can fill in the blank. And what I found out that day, a three-day stay in the hospital, was that I had stage three cancer with seven tumors. Two of them were the size of league balls, and they were sitting on my heart. And I was getting 5% oxygen, 
So my body was going into what they called hibernation to survive. And the doctor said you wouldn't have survived another day. I had double pneumonia. I had so many other things that every, they kept coming in and telling, we're sorry to have to tell you this. And I said, well, then don't. I said, because I have a God who's more than able. So the Lord said, trust in the gifts that I have placed in your children, because all my children were there. I have wonderful children, by the way. God, I don't know how I deserve them, but he has given me wonderful supportive children. And he said, I want you to trust the gifts that I put in your children. Now, all of them weren't. They all know God and they all believe there is a God in them, but they were all walking in tune with what God's plan for them was. And so for me, a control person, to say, here, hand your life over to your kids, he didn't say hand the keys to the car over to them. He said, give your life to them. But trust the gifts I imparted to them, and I did. And they began to work with the doctors, and things began to change. And I could focus on my, my heart with God. I could stay where I needed to stay and not be concerned about all the physical things around me. I was on heart medication, statin. I was on pre-diabetic medication. I had to go through chemotherapy. Um, so anybody who's been through knows what all of that entails. But I can say to you today, I'm not on any medication. And my blood reports have come back. They are so astonished. All my levels are within the good normal range. So he is more than able. And when he raised me up, he gave me a vision for something. My kids still think I'm a little off a little bit, but because I, I normally don't share with people what God's put on my heart, but he had given me a heart for a nation, and it was Scotland. I didn't know anything about Scotland. I don't have Scottish blood that I know of. But he gave me a heart and a prayer, and day and night continually I would pray, and God would give me the words to say. He gave me a vision to go and to stand on the highest point, Ben Nevis, and one day you will see I will proclaim the glory and the victory of God. Why he asked me to do that, I have no clue. But it doesn't matter. He asked me to do it and I'm going to go do it. Now you have to remember, I couldn't walk from here to the door without... I had canes. I had walkers. I couldn't walk from here to the door. He helped me to lose 60 pounds. I'm walking 10 to 15 miles a day, except, a little caveat here, I had knee issues, so I wasn't, but just before the knee issue, I was walking 10 to 15 miles a day and riding my bike the same. And my heart is strong. I have a little bit of high blood pressure, but it has nothing to do with my heart. All my heart numbers are, you know, they're just astonished. But there is one tumor that is still present, that's growing, and that it's hitting my renal area, and it's hitting the blood vessel in the renal area, and that's why I have some high blood pressure. It is not to do with my heart. My heart is strong. So it's going to carry me where I need to go. Again, I couldn't listen to the people around me. Mom, this is crazy. I mean, they meant well, but I'm usually a very pragmatic person. So for me to come and like out of the blue begin to express to them that I wasn't going to hide what God had done and what he had given me. Because without a vision, what happens? My people perish. He gave me a vision for something. And he gave me a hope and a promise as he will do for you. There's still struggles. I'm not going to tell you everything is peaches and roses and life without pits and the cherries, you know. But I don't look at those. I look up because my redemption draws nigh. There's days I don't feel like getting out of bed. There's days that, oh, you remember where you're at? You know what you've got? No, but, but for my God. So I have to let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Anyway, I got off a little bit. But sorry. Well, recently, 
the Lord put something on my heart to give money that I'm saving a little here, a little there, because my needs are met. I don't have an abundance, but my needs are met. So I've been putting a little away for a new via newer vehicle. I know I couldn't afford a new one, but a newer vehicle. And he told me, I want you to put this money here. Okay, Lord. Don't even think. I don't think what the left or the right does. I said, all right, Lord. Because in all this process, what happened? It's like the dial and the radio, those old things we used to have. You could, you know, you'd get the squelching and stuff, and then all of a sudden you fine tune, you get that other fine tuned dial, and all of a sudden you hear really clear. But that's what begins to happen when you get your focus on God and what He has called you. Because how many of us have sat there, and I know it was me, God, what do you have for my life? It seems like I'm not doing anything. What do you know? Um, but you know what? You never know the person that you will affect that will change the world or that will uh, bring transformation. Aren't you a part? Because those that go behind, uh, stay behind and pray and those that go, like David's army, have the same reward. Don't keep your eye on the magnitude of what you're to do. Keep your eye focused on him. Well, I said, okay. So I have two cars now. Actually, I have three, but I have two cars. Neither are working. So I had just given all this money right, for my car. All right, Lori, what are you going to do? Last night, before I began to prepare, my aunt calls me. Her husband just passed away on the 7th. I told you, we had three major family deaths in the past couple weeks. And she said, you know, I just, if it's okay, I just want to give you my husband's car. She said, I see you driving it. And she said, you know what? I think your son Patrick's going to like it because it's a Ford. <laughs> He's a Ford man, by the way. <laughs> but again, I wasn't looking for it. She didn't know. I didn't say anything to anybody. God put on her heart in the moment of her grief, her sorrow, a man she'd been with for 47 years, calls me and says, I want to give you my car. That car is more valuable than any new Mercedes or any new car you could give me because God provided. Now these trials sound simple. Maybe, but believe me, they were not. <laughs> But we must stay the course. You must choose not to waver. Believe me, you have, it says, the Bible says, don't look to the left or the right, but keep your eyes straight and focused on him. And one day when I was younger in the Lord and I was driving down the highway, and I don't know if you remember, but I-55, all of a sudden, like overnight, you see all these ads. You know, it, it didn't have but maybe a couple along the way. And I'm driving to work and I'm like, whoa, what's this? And I keep looking, and I almost hit somebody. And God said, what are you looking at? Keep your eyes on me, because I am the author, the finisher, and the perfecter of your faith. Not circumstances. So, oh, I, the, the scripture for you must choose not to waver is Matthew 24, 13. But the one who perseveres to the end shall be saved. You will be saved from all your affliction, from all your trials. The trials of the righteous are many, but God will deliver you from them all. So we are without excuse before that throne of grace. We have no excuse for not taking that next step. How do you make a place for grace in your heart? I have found, now these are just my insights, but you have to allow God to change what he wants to change. You have to find his will for you in your life. You have to humble yourself under God's mighty hand, and in the proper season, he will lift you up, 1 Peter 5, 6. And then you have to stand on those promises that he gives you. They have to be as real as the ground underneath this earthly uh, dwelling. 
those promises, that promise that he would never leave me or forsake me, that he would take care of the widows and orphans and he was going to take care of me, had to be real no matter what it looked like. So I had to stand on his promise and everything else had to move. I re developed a boldness that I never had before. He began to put courage in my heart to face things. I had someone I could rely on before. I had a lion. And he would roar for me when we needed roaring. I stayed in the, in the quiet place because that, I, I just, I would acquiesce to people sometimes because I didn't want the battle. But God has changed my heart. Allow grace to mature through practice. Practice being aware of his presence each moment of each day. For he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Deuteronomy 31.6 And then release the need to control. What, this is what he said to me. I was like, what you control, you own. And when you own something, who pays the bill? You do. What he provides, he will deliver. And my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory, Philippians 4.19. And you're going to find yourself spending more time with God, praying with him day and night without ceasing, like Paul tells us. We think in our mind, how can you do that? Well, when every thought, everything within you comes from him, or you're talking to him, that's how you pray. That's a prayer. That's reaching out to him. So spend more, you, you, end, you end up spending more time with God. You wonder how can I have more time? You can have time. You can have time. If you can have time in the little water closet, you can have time anywhere. On the bus, in the car, wherever. Shut off the music sometimes. Even good worship music. And hear him. Rejoice always. This is a key. And again I say rejoice. Um, this one was, I had to think about, but you have to live openly and honestly. Providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And that's 2 Corinthians 8.21. So we have to find honesty. How many of us are living, nobody really knows us. That's why I, I, the Lord said to open up, so I opened up. I don't usually do that. But you have to be open and honest with one another. In love. You're always covered by love. You're motivated by love. And seven is, whatsoever he tells you to do, do it. John 2, 5. I truly believe that in these days God is calling his people to the banquet, to the banquet table where in the presence, even in the presence of our enemies, he makes us to prosper. I won't read it, but go over Psalm 23 again. Sometimes we recite that and we, and we lose the meaning of it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Take that. Believe that. Act upon it. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. David said, though fear comes, I will not give in to fear. It, it'll come. It'll hit you hard. I will fear no evil, for why? He is with us in all that we do. And can you imagine, he prepares a table, a banquet table in the presence of our enemies for us. Your cup overflows, my cup is overflowing. Does my body work every day? No. It tries to pull me back down. But I have to say, get thee behind me, because my God has given me a call. He's wanting us to hear his voice and his only in these days. And I know, because I, I know that I know, and take it from my heart, not this isn't. But he said to me, 
why people need to hear my voice and follow none other. So we have to practice that presence of God every day if we're going to make it through. We can see upheaval and turmoil and all the things happening in this world. But no matter how loud the roar, we have to hear him. He's a still, small voice. So what does that mean? That means we have to tune him in. John 10, 5. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee for him, from him, for they know not the voice of a stranger. Don't know strangers' voices, know his. 27, 527 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. But to know that kind of intimacy, it must be nurtured. Just like when you get married, you don't know your spouse every little jot and tittle. You, you take them on by faith. Because, boy, you find a lot of things. Boy, if I had only known. <laughs> but it's the intimacy, and it's love that compels you to keep moving forward, right? Say, okay. I always tell my kids, when they're getting ready to get married, pick the thing that bothers you the most about the person you're going to marry. And if you can have the grace to love despite that, then I give my thumbs up. Because you can't choose to change anybody. That choice, again, you have to tell your heart to beat again. You have to tell your heart to move forward. And that takes time and commitment. But take the first step. Be courageous. Be courageous and do not be afraid. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I feel like there might be a few of you in here that are going through some pretty bad places. You might even feel like you're alone. Like I can't tell anybody. Sometimes it's things we feel like we can't even tell. Find somebody. Find somebody who has, who knows how to keep a secret in their heart. Who knows how to go before God on your behalf. Don't carry it alone. That's why we're the body. But if the body can't go to the body, who can you go to? Think about that. If you're not trustworthy, if you're not honest, where can we go? And the world is hurting because the body has no place to go. Don't be that, that arm, that ear, that eye, that leg that can't be counted on. Know him. And when you're in his presence, besides being filled with joy, you're also filled with love. And love covers a multitude of things. Doesn't excuse it. It covers it. So find somebody. Find a friend. Get to know somebody in the body of Christ. Work through these things together because we were not created to be alone. God said it was not good that man be alone. And it doesn't have to be a spouse. It can be a friend. And if you have some time, look at Psalm 107. I'm only going to just say, I know I've gone over, and I'm sorry, Pastor, but I'm doing pretty good for an hour's sleep, I think. So. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. And over and over and over again, God says, through whatever trials, he, he mentions these trials. He mentions being in the desert, finding no city, thirst, hunger. Your soul is fainting within you. Have you ever felt like you've been there? Of course you have. But then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distresses. He talked about the shadow of death, being a prisoner, afflicted. Many of us at times have felt afflicted. 
we have felt like a prisoner. Maybe it's to an addiction. Maybe it's to a relationship. We have felt like prison. But he comes and he releases the prisoner, the captive. And then he says, when they cried to the Lord in their trouble, he delivered, from, he delivered them from their distresses. So all these different things he talks about were the condition of the heart. But he says, but nevertheless, I will deliver you in your distress. And he said, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. And let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving, not flesh, but of thanksgiving. And tell of his deeds in songs of joy. And then, after all these other things, scenarios that he takes you through that maybe you might experience. He says he turns the desert into the pools of water. And he takes parched, so he takes the parched land and he'll fill you with that water. If you're hungry, he will feed you. He will give you a harvest. But he raises up the needy out of the affliction and makes their families like flocks. He didn't say put you out here to hang out all by yourself or to run and hide. He puts you in a flock. And what does the flock do? They survive because they are congregated together. When you divide the flock, they're easy targets for the enemy. Don't find yourself an easy target. Find a group of believers that will come and be there and stand with you. So, Today, I just want to encourage you to find that <coughs> courage. Because it does take courage to take that first step. It did take courage. I said, I don't have the courage, Lord, to face this with my husband, without him. I don't have the strength. I've never had to do that. I always pushed him in front and said, here, you do it. That's what he did for me. But I had to learn to stand up because I saw my family being attacked. I saw things coming into my home. And I had to say no. I had to stand up and have courage. Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble nor be dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with you wherever you go. Be strong in the Lord and the hope that he gives each one of you. Thank you.